to 17, we want to look at the most astonishing thing that John saw, and that's saying a lot because he sees some amazing things. He sees the seals broken and the plagues come, and he sees the trumpets, judgments fall and all this, and he sees the whole earth devastated. But the thing that amazed him more than any other one thing is what we're going to look at in chapter 17. So I hope you can see it. If you grasp it, you'll be shocked and amazed too. Now, Revelation chapter 17, let's begin with verse 1. Keep your Bible open, keep your mind open throughout the message today. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And let me stop and say that that word, that's translated admiration here, really means to marvel or to wonder or to be in amazement. And we see that in the next verse. And the angel said to me, Wherefore did you marvel? And I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her, with whom the seven head, uh, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. And so John is greatly amazed and wondered. Uh, I was... Uh, I listen to the tapes of Steve Sturgeon sometimes, and he's a, a very strong King James only person, very strong, but when he's explained this verse, he had to say that it does not mean that John admired this woman. It was not a ma uh, adoration or a admiration. It was amazement, and all translation will tell you that John wondered with great wonder, great amazement, or astonishment. And the next verse bears that out. Why did you marvel? He's marveling. He can't believe his eyes that this is happening. And he's astonished, amazed more than anything else he saw in the book of Revelation. I wondered with a great astonishment. And you will too if you can grasp this message today. And so the angel said, why did you marvel? Now verse 8. The beast that you saw... Now, he, he, he just told, I'm going to explain this mystery. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now, verse 8, And the beast that you saw was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is past, present, and future. It was, then it is not. It's, it's out of existence at this time that we speak. And yet is. It's coming into existence in the future and already is coming into existence. We'll explain that. Now verse 9. I want you to listen carefully. Verse 9. Here's the mind that has wisdom. Now if you don't have much sense, you, you don't have any spiritual discernment, you got your mind made up, if you're critical, you're going to rebel against what the Word of God speaks to you about today. But if you're smart, you have a mind that has wisdom, you see it and you receive it. And so here's the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Does anybody know which is the city on earth today, that the city that sits on seven hills or the one that sits on seven mountains? Can anybody tell me? Rome, yeah. We got some smart people here. Okay. Now, 
Verse 10, And there were seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten kings which you saw, or, or the rather, I'm sorry, the ten horns that you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast, which is the Antichrist and the false prophet. And they shall make war with the Lamb. Now, who's the Lamb? Jesus. <clears throat> These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, The waters which you saw... Where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which you saw, or which thou sawest, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Which city was it that was capital city over the whole world when the New Testament was written in A.D. 96? Rome. Okay, we've already got some insight there. Have we got any pictures? Yeah, we got some pictures. Uh, let's look here at the artist's conception now, uh, this is important. That's a red dragon, scarlet-colored dragon with seven heads, okay? That's back in chapter 12. But in chapter 13, John sees a beast that comes up out of the sea. And I want you to remember this. Now, he's got seven heads and ten horns on his head. And you'll see that's the same number we just read about, that the beast that carried the scarlet-colored woman had seven heads and ten horns. It's the same beast. This is the beast presented in a different way. The same beast that the woman's going to ride. The great whore is going to ride this beast. Uh, but turn back now. I want, I want to come back. Can we come back to that picture? There it is. Okay, that's the second beast that comes up out of the earth. Though. And he's really the religious beast or the false prophet, if you read chapter 13, the last part. He's the false prophet, and the people are following and listening to him. And these two beasts are working together. And actually, it's the same two beasts we're going to see in just a second. Uh, uh, but they're presented in a different way because the book of Revelation is a book of symbol. He, remember chapter 1, verse 1, he symbolized it or signified it unto his servant John. And so uh, these symbols can be presented in different ways, but they always are illustrating uh, a certain point. This is the beast that comes up out of the uh, revived Roman Empire or the European Union that we see forming today. This beast represents that. What is happening today as I speak in Europe is all the common market nations are coming together. But this is the religious beast that's going to uh, exhort people to follow the Antichrist represented by this beast here. Okay, let's look at the next one now. Yeah, here she comes. This is the whore that's got all kinds of gold and silver, got a cup in her hand, and it's full of wine for people to drink. By the way, which is the only church you know of that serves intoxicating fermented wine at the communion? There's one that does that. And this beast has got seven heads and ten horns, just like the beast we just looked back uh, in chapter 13. And this is the woman, and it's a red beast or scarlet colored. She's got red dress and also purple, red and purple. And she's uh, got all this jewelry on, all of her arms and fingers and a golden cup. What in the world does all this represent? Well, we'll see after we pray. Let's all stand for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, but as Paul said, the law is spiritual, but we are carnal. So we pray for enlightenment. We pray for the Holy Spirit to move in our midst. Save the lost. Bless your people, we pray.
through it all, may the name of Jesus be exalted. May the truth be proclaimed. And Lord, may our hearts be open and receptive to the truth, even though it might be contrary to what we've been taught or what we think or what we believe. Help us to understand and receive what thus saith the Lord. God grant it for all of us. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> What's going to happen to religion after the rapture of the church? I believe the next thing's on, on God's agenda is to come and take his people out of here. The bridegroom's going to come for his bride, and the saved people are going to go up in a moment in the twinkle of an eye, what we call the rapture of the church. But what's going to happen to religion after the church is gone? Well, see, religion and Christianity is two different things. And a lot of churches are going to go right on the next Sunday, just like they always have gone. They're not going to miss a member. Even the preacher's going to be standing in the pulpit after the true church is gone. Now, the Bible predicts that there's going to become a great apostasy or departing from the Christian faith, but they're still professed to be Christians, and then all the religions will join up with Christianity and will have a one-world religion. And that's what's pictured here in Revelation chapter 17, uh, and that's what people are working at today. In fact, let me read you a uh, newspaper clipping. Christian unity is the topic from the Associated Press. Both the Roman Catholic Church and the World Council of Churches declare that they are committed to work for the visible unity of all Christians. And then we see it goes further than that, that uh, in this news article, the Pope's ecumenical excursions. Uh, it talks about a 30,000-mile trip that Pope John II has made to nurture friendly ecumenical relations with other religions. And then uh, I have a picture here. I'll show you the picture. Here's the Pope and all different kinds of religious leaders sitting together uh, at a certain... Uh, uh, Mathen, um, meeting they had, or gathering they had, a, a, a Sisi. Uh, there's 150 different religious leaders from different places. And there's a new article about uh, that thing. And it says that uh, uh, Pope John has called for an interdenominational and interreligious day of prayer for world peace. And he goes on and talks about this gathering where they had uh, uh, Anglicans and the Dalai Lama was there, and the Russian Orthodox uh, participated, and also Buddhists and Muslims, Hindus, Jews, leaders of traditional religions from Africa and other countries. And uh, Pope John II has said that Roman Catholics, liberal Protestants, Jews, Hindus, and Buddhists, and Muslims all worship the same God. And in the book of Revelation, I believe... In chapter 17, it has a picture, a symbolic picture, of how after the rapture of the church, all religions are going to come together under the Pope and under the Antichrist. They're going to be working together, one boosting the other. And uh, we'll see that uh, it's a picture of religion, a one-world religion. See, everything's going one world. We've got a one-world bank. We have a United Nations that's trying to uh, bring, the, bring the whole world together politically. And we are working towards a one-world religion. Because they say, well, a lot of wars have been fought over religion, and the only way to bring peace is get all the religions together. And I believe this is what you have pictured here in Revelation chapter 17. Now, it's called in verse 5, a Mystery Babylon. Now, if you study the Bible, you'll see that false religion and rebellion against God on a big scale began in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. Babel, the Hebrew word in Greek is Babylon, and it means confusion. And they came together there under Nimrod and built a tower in rebellion against God. And according to uh, some Bible historians, if you read uh, the two Babylons by Alexander Hyssop or uh, Babylonian Mystery Religion by uh, Ralph Woodrow, it will explain to you that false religion actually started at the Tower of Babylon 
or the Tower of Babel. And uh, it started with uh, the worship of the mother and child. Samaris uh, and, and Tammuz, where his son is supposed to have uh, rose from the dead. He was killed by a wild boar and then rose from the dead. And they had statues of him and they worshipped him. They had uh, religious sacrifices or masses. And uh, uh, she was called the Queen of Heaven. And all the way through the Old Testament, you see that like I was, uh, Jeremiah 44, 15, it speaks about the Queen of Heaven that they wanted to worship. And uh, all the way through, you, you see the same characteristics practically uh, that false religions have always had down through the years. And it was referred to sometimes as the Babylonian mystery religion, the worship of the mother and child, where they confessed their sins to the priest, where they prayed for prayers for the dead and stuff like that. And all the way through, uh, you, you'll see it happened. Uh, uh, but anyway, in, in Rome, Italy, which was the capital of the world in New Testament times. There was one emperor named Constantine that got converted to Christianity, so-called. A lot of people doubt whether he ever did, including me. But he was a genius in the f this, that he wanted to join religion and paganism because there was a conflict. And he thought if we could get them together, we could have peace throughout the Roman Empire and consequently throughout the world and so in AD 312 I believe he's supposed to have been converted he saw the cross and uh, didn't even know what it was but somebody told him that's the sign of the Christian but anyway through the process of time they joined up paganism with Christianity many of the idol temples were just renamed from some idol like Zeus or Astaroth or there was a picture maybe of Astaroth she became the Virgin Mary but anyway paganism and Christianity joined together. And by the way, the Roman emperors uh, were called a pontiff. And they were automatically, as the emperor, head over the pagan religion. But then when Constantine was converted and uh, Christianized the Roman Empire, then he was head over the pagan religion and so-called Christianity. And it kept on merging and adding until you have the monstrosity that's called the Roman Catholic Church today. Now, I want you to look. In fact, I think I'll read this to start with. No, I'm going to say that a little bit later. I'll read it in a few minutes. But I want to show you something, uh, first of all, in, in chapter uh, 17, verse 5 of Revelation, that uh, this woman has a name written on her forehead, and the name is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. You see, all false religion basically started back in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 11 at the of Babel, and later on it's called Babylon. <clears throat> and uh, it's the mother, or it produced, uh, and uh, it's in cahoots with all the false religions of the world during the future under the reign of the Antichrist. Now, who is this woman? Well, uh, in verse 9 we found out that uh, it's a woman that sits on, uh, she has seven heads there that, are, that represent seven mountains on which the world uh, woman sitteth. If you read the World Book Encyclopedia, it'll tell you in the opening paragraph that Rome is the city that sits on seven hills. If you go down to the travel agency and say, I want a ticket to the city on seven hills, they'll automatically give you a, a trip to Rome. That's just known. Okay, so we're talking about Rome. Now, in verse 18, I think is the key to the whole chapter. And I want you to listen the mind that has wisdom will listen and realize the importance of this. In chapter 17, verse 18, The woman that you saw is the great city that ruleth over the kings of the earth. Now, everybody knows in New Testament times that Rome ruled the world. And the capital of Rome uh, was uh, there in Rome, Italy. The boot-shaped thing that sticks out in the Mediterranean Sea. The capital was a city called Rome. Okay, and so it's no question about this great harlot woman, the mother of abominations of the earth, it's Rome he's speaking about. Now, notice it's a great city. Now, usually it's a country like Babylon ruled the world, uh, or the Assyrians ruled the world uh, at one time. They are a nation. They are a country that dominates. But 
There's only one city. You stop and think. There's only one city on the face of the earth right now that rules over people. A city, not a nation. In fact, if you're a Roman Catholic, you're a citizen of two countries. And uh, when my son, Peter Hipple, was a drill instructor at Paris Island, South Carolina, on one occasion the priest wanted to talk to all the Roman Catholic recruits there. And he, uh, uh, Peter wasn't supposed to hear it, but he heard it. And the priest reminded them, even though you're American citizens, you're in the military, your first allegiance is to the Roman Catholic Church. We send a representative to the Vatican, Vatican City in Rome. We have an ambassador to Vatican, to the Vatican, just like we have an ambassador to China or to Hong Kong or somewhere. Okay, and so it's a city, a city. Uh, are you getting that? It's a city. There's only one city on the face of the earth right now that has power over the whole world, more or less. And that city is, Va is the Vatican in Rome, Italy. Is that right? Okay. And so uh, we we'll find it out. Now, let me read this clipping that I started to read. And I want to just show you that the founder of almost every mainline denomination knew who the Antichrist was and put it in print. So I'm not the only crazy one, okay, if you think I'm crazy. The leaders, before uh, the denominations turned liberal, they all knew who the Antichrist was. Let me read you what Martin Luther said. The papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. And personally, I declare I owe, no, I owe the Pope no other obedience than to the Antichrist. So Martin Luther believed that the Pope was the Antichrist. Now, uh, Cotton Mather a congregational theologian said, in the Pope of Rome, all the characteristics of that Antichrist are so marvelously answered that if any who read the Scriptures do not see it, there's a marvelous blindness upon them. <coughs> now, Thomas Kramer, who was an Anglican uh, theologian, said, wherefore it followeth to be the seat of the Antichrist and the Pope, the very Antichrist himself, and I can prove the same by many other scriptures and old writings and strong reasons. Now, let me read you what uh, we, uh, Roger Williams, the first Baptist in America, said. Uh, to get the first Baptist, you'd have to go back uh, 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 over 1,500 years. In fact, you'd have to go all the way back to John the Baptist. But the first uh, Baptist in America, uh, Roger Williams, said, The Pope, he is the son of perdition. Now, what did John Calvin, he's respected by many uh, people as one of the great theologians of all church history. He said, some persons think us too severe and censor us when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. Now, John Knox, the one that started Presbyterian Church in Scotland, said the Pope should be recognized as a very Antichrist, the son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. Now, John Wesley, the one that started the Methodist Church, he said... He is in the emphatical sense the man of sin, son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes. Uh, well, speaking of the papacy, he said, he is a, uh, emphatical, in, in the emphatical sense the man of sin. He said that the pope is the son of perdition, and also notice he says he's caused the death of numberless multitudes. Now, John Wesley was a very educated man who spoke, spoke several languages, started in the uh, uh, Methodist church, him and his uh, brother uh, that wrote the hymns, Charles Wesley. And uh, I've read to you what all the great thinkers in the Christian world, the Protestant world, have said. They think, like I do, that Revelation chapter 17 is the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope is the Antichrist or the false prophet that is represented here. Now, let's go and look at further of what this chapter says. If you notice in uh, Revelation chapter 17, uh, he says uh, in the last part of verse 17, this great horde that sits upon many waters. Now, many waters are explained in verse 15. It's nations and peoples and tongues. So we're talking about a great uh, organization that rules over uh, great nations. In fact, the whole world practically will worship uh, the Antichrist and this uh, religious beast. Here, and uh, let me read verse 15. He said unto me, The waters that you saw where the 
whore sitteth of peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So we're looking at a religious organization that's going to uh, sit upon many waters, which means it's going to rule many uh, nations and tongues and people of the earth. It'll be a one world religion. Okay, and it says, With whom, in verse 2, the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been drank, uh, have been drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, uh, back in the Old Testament, uh, the prophets would talk about when Israel turned from God and worship idols. They would call that whoredoms and spiritual fornication. And in the New Testament, James chapter 4, verse 4, it says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity against God. Well, we are spiritual idol uh, 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 rather adulterers, and we are adulterers whenever we let pagan practices be mixed with Christianity. God wants his word pure. Every word of God is pure. Add not unto it, lest he add to you the plagues. Uh, Pro, uh, Proverbs 30, verse 6. And so uh, the nations of the earth have been drunk with uh, this woman's. They've committed uh, fornication. Now, he carried me away in the wilderness, and he saw this woman now, and she's clothed in uh, scarlet. She, he, she's, she's sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. And in verse 4, her, her, uh, number, uh, her colors are scarlet and purple. And, and you'll see that's the same colors the dragon was there. Who does the dragon represent back in chapter 12, the great red dragon? Remember that? That was the devil, right? And in fact, uh, uh, in the Catholic uh, encyclopedia, it says uh, purple is the color of the bishops and other prelates. And it says the cup that this woman holds in her hand, a cup, a golden cup. And uh, it says the cup is the most important of all the sacred vessels. And uh, what color do the cardinals wear when they meet? What color does the pope wear many times? It's a scarlet color or a red color. And it's represented here uh, in Revelation chapter 17 by this woman and the beast that she is riding. And also... In verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. And this uh, cup is full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, this is a woman that's very rich. She's decked with gold and silver and precious stones. There's a book called The Vatican Billions. That's the name of the book the Vatican Billions, and it claims that the Roman Catholic Church, with all of its riches and stocks and buildings and art and property, distilleries and wine vineyards that it owns, is the second richest nation on earth, second only to the United States of America. And so this woman is pictured as very rich and prosperous, Okay, and uh, verse 5, let's repeat, upon her forehead was a name written, and it's in capital letters, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of earth. And it's called Mystery Babylon because Babylon is where false religion started, and uh, there's all kinds of calls and religions and the isms and schisms that's joined up with this woman. You have a one-world religion of all the different uh, Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and you name it. It's in this uh, religious system here, but it's headed up by Rome. It's headed up by the Pope. It's headed up by the Roman Catholic monstrosity, the Roman Catholic organization. It's never called a church. Now, we misuse the word church. The church is going up in the rapture. God's people are the church, a group of baptized believers in a local church with a uh, pastor and members and deacons, there's nowhere in the Bible that an organization or a denomination is called the church. A church refers to a, a local group of believers that meet together to worship God and carry out the Great Commission. And God never uses the word church to refer to the Roman Catholic system because it's not a church. It's the mother of abominations of the earth. It's a harlot, a prostitute. It's a synagogue of Satan and not a church. Now, I want you to notice in verse 6, and remember what John Wesley said about the Pope. He's the Antichrist. 
and it's caused the death of numberless multitudes. Numberless multitudes. Well, I figured up through reading Fox's Book of Martyrs and another book on church history called How Does Handbook of the Bible that the Roman Catholic Church has put to, get, uh, put to death at least 68 million innocent people down through history. And that's what it means when it refers to in Revelation 17, verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I, I, I was amazed with a great wonder, a great astonishment, a great amazement. And, and, and the, in a nutshell, it's this. Jesus started church of people that love one another. If you're a Christian, you love other people people you love other Christians and we're here to preach the gospel and tell the world that Jesus saves and we we are the church God's people that tells people that salvation by grace is a gift of God and the characteristic of the church and of God's people by this shall all men know you my disciples if you have love one towards another and that's what John knew he's the apostle of love okay and then he sees this monstrosity, this organization that's killing God's people down through the centuries by the millions, putting them in torture chambers, inventing new ways of torturing people like the rack and thumb screws and, and putting people in a little old tube before sale where they can't straighten up and let them die. By killing them all different ways just because they own a Bible. Just because they refused to pray to the Virgin Mary. Just because they had the kids rebaptized in a scripture way after they got saved. And would not accept the Catholic sprinkling as baptism. And John sees this organization that's going on in the name of Christianity. And people are calling it a church. And yet they perverted the gospel. The message they're preaching has no resemblance whatever to the true gospel of Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God. You never heard the Pope say that. You never will because they believe that the church saves. It's through the sacraments and the mass and confession to the priest. That's what saves. And that's an abomination. That's what John calls it. And, and to see that the people of the world, people like you that have been deceived and you call it Christianity, you call it a church, it has no resemblance of Christianity except in some names that it uses. But it's not Christian. It's the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And to think that this monstrous organization there with hundreds of millions of followers in almost every generation, and people are following that, and it's taken the place of Christianity. And here's Christianity over here. It's never been in the Roman Catholic Church. We've always been outside the Roman Catholic Church for the most part. I mean, there's been a few saved people in the Roman Catholic Church, although in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, and this is a message for you, come out of her, my people, that you be not a partaker of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18, verse 4. We're not supposed to be partaker of false religion. And some people think I'm criticized because you have been mistaught and you think it doesn't matter what God you pray to, whether it's Allah or whether you pray to the tree or whether you pray to Almighty God, the God of the Bible. You've been deceived. You think, well, if it's religious, all right, don't criticize anybody's religion. But if you think the Muslims are going to heaven, you've got another thought coming. It's only the people that believe this Bible that accept Jesus and trust in him and him alone is for their soul salvation. You trust in the sacraments. You trust in religion. You trust in your good works. You trust in your, uh, what you fancy is your good character. You trust in all that. You'll be damned. Jesus is the way. And there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And if you don't believe that, you perverted the Christian message. But not only now is this system that we're talking about in Revelation chapter 17. Now, a cult is one thing. If you want to be an atheist, you want to be a Jehovah's Witness, that's your business, okay. But what makes this religion so bad is that it persecutes and kills people that disagrees. They say, we are the mother church. Yeah, you're the mother of harlots and abominations to earth. That's what the Bible calls it. But they say, you don't have no right 
to believe anything except what we tell you. We've got the authority to interpret the Scriptures, and our tradition is on the same plane as the uh, Scriptures, and, and we're supposed to tell you what to believe. And if you don't accept uh, our doctrines, then you, you, you'll be burned at the stake or you'll be put to death. I mean, it's all right. I don't agree with the say to Jehovah's Witness, all right? But they don't bother me. They don't, they don't kill people that disagree with them. But down through the centuries, if you just go to the library, read up on the Inquisitions. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read some church history. You'll see that, uh, well, the Inquisition started uh, back down in the dark ages when the Protestant movement began to uh, take place. And they wanted to kill them all. And in, in some places like the whole, I said, I'm saying the country, not the little town, but the country of Bohemia. At one time, the Roman Catholics came in and, this, and killed everybody that wasn't Catholic, and most of them were Protestant. In other words, they wiped out entire towns, entire countries. If you read how many people were just killed in Spain during the Inquisitions, and not only the 68 million that they killed in the Inquisition, but uh, in other places... And times, they were responsible for the death of many people. For example, did you know Adolf Hitler was financed and supported by the Roman Catholic Church and all of his generals were Roman Catholics? But they didn't bomb Roman Catholic churches? Uh, if you can grasp, now, um, we, we're still amazed and we're astounded at the Holocaust. Six or eight million Jews burning Hitler's furnaces. And we think... How horrendous. How horrible. How could that happen? If you read about the Inquisitions, you'll find that 8 million Jews is very insignificant compared to the number that the Roman Catholic Church has killed down through the years. They've shed the blood of saints and martyrs, and God holds them responsible. And some of y'all down, well, you're going to take sides against me and for the church. Well, when you take sides with that system, then you are responsible for what they've done. You become guilty by association with them. I mean, in Romans chapter 1, verse 32, it talks about how not only people that do those things, but those that approve of it. Let me read Romans chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 32. I didn't tell you what it says. That people that do these things are worthy of death, but not only do them, but have pleasure or approve or applaud of those that do do them. In other words, if you take sides with, well, he had a right to cut his wife's throat and kill her dead. You take sides with the murderer, you are partly guilty in God's sight. You're aiding and abetting. And when you take sides, when you take up for the Roman Catholic organization, then you're guilty by applauding it and approving of what they're doing. It's a very serious thing. You'll find out when you stand before God. It shed the blood of the saints and martyrs. And so when John sees this, he, he's amazed. And it is amazing if you can grasp the picture. But I'm afraid I'm not painting very clearly. But here, instead of the loving, caring church that's trying to evangelize the world, uh, God's people love one another. Thank God for a close-knit church, people that love one another, hug one another uh, uh, here at Community Baptist Church. It's a wonderful thing. Everybody ought to be part of a good, loving Christian family. It adds so much to your life. Thank God for it. But instead of that, John looks and sees in the future a one-world organization that's called in itself Christian, but it's really not a church. It spews out these abominations and hundreds of millions of people are fallen and they're killing people in the name of Jesus. They'll get their armies together and go wipe out a town because it's Protestant. They'll get their armies together and go on a crusade to kill the Muslims instead of trying to evangelize them and in the process kill the Jews and Christians get the blame for it. One reason why Muslims are so adamant against Christianity today because of what the Roman Catholic Church did during the Crusades. But Christian people, God's loving people, have never gotten an army together to go kill somebody for no reason at all. And so John is amazed that people are fool, people are con, people are stupid enough to look at this organization and think it's Christian when everything about it is unchristian. 
And they're teaching, you know, Peter was the first pope. He's the foundation for the church. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the foundation. They teach you're saved through the church. The Bible teaches you're saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. And they teach, you can pray to Mary and all the saints, pray for the dead people. They talk about purgatory, and their Bible never even mentions purgatory. The Bible, I mean, they say Mary was a perpetual virgin, but the Bible teaches she had kids. And five, at least five, or at least six, in fact, James and Joseph, Simon, Judas, and the sisters that they had. And one of the most abominational, abominable things that they do is offering mass, which is another sacrifice for sins. That's an abomination. To offer a sacrifice for sins. They, Jesus paid it all. He made one sacrifice for sins forever and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus paid it all. He left behind a finished work. You don't have to do anything to be saved. God's already done everything it takes to save you and keep you out of hell and save you, make you his child and carry you to heaven. God's already done it all. And whenever you go offer a sacrifice for sin, you might as well spit in God's face and say, I don't believe in the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, we'll make our own. You don't realize what a serious thing it is in the sight of God. And they have something called transubstantiation. And that's a big word that sounds so religious. And they go with their robes and their chants and their candles. And they say that when the priest says his little hocus pocus thing uh, over the uh, bread and the wine, it actually turns into the body of Jesus. And that priest knows he's lying. But gullible people fall that. In fact, I, 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 I'll tell you, I'll make a proposition. If anybody watches by television or any, anybody you can, you can get, any priest you know, I'll make you a proposition. I can prove he's lying. He don't believe that that little wafer turns into the body and that wine turns into the blood of Jesus. And I can prove it. Because all, I want to present a proposition. Let me make some batter from which we'll make the little wafers, okay? And I'm going to put a little bit of arsenic and uh, maybe a couple of little uh, drops of poison in it of some kind. And then we'll see if they will take communion that day. They know it's got poison. Hey, but that don't matter. It don't matter what's in it because it's going to change when the priest says hocus pocus, cornbread and cabbage leaves. It's going to change into the actual body and blood of Jesus. So it don't matter if it's got poison in it. A little arsenic, it won't be arsenic anymore. It'll be the body and blood of Jesus. Now, how many think that priest really believes what he's saying and that he'll actually take communion that day? No one has had poison in it, but don't matter now because he's changed it. How many think he'll really take, how many, how many think he'd take communion that day? How many think he wouldn't take communion that day? <laughs> You're just like me. No. It's a bunch of garbage to extract money from gullible people that don't read their Bible. Okay. Uh Yeah, just once. Uh, there's so much I want to bring out. I, I'm going to have to drop on down to uh, verse 12. And uh, it tells us in Revelation 17, verse 12, the ten kings which you saw, or rather, I'm sorry, the ten horns that you saw are ten corn, uh, kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but shall receive power as kings one hour with the beast or with the false prophet, you see. Now, these ten kings or ten rulers that shall emerge in Europe and the uh, European Union and they'll work with the Antichrist which also will come from the European Union. He'll come from one nation in Europe and then he'll rule over three nations but all the other ten kings or rulers uh, they'll give their power, they'll combine with the Antichrist so he'll become a world ruler. And in verse 13 it says, they all have one mind, they'll give their power and strength to the beast. They'll all work together to get the Antichrist in power and the world will worship him. <clears throat> and you'll worship him if you're not saved. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, 
And verse 14, it says they'll make war with the Lamb. Now, you know, a lamb, that's what Jesus is most often called in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> I think I could whip a, li a, a, a lamb. A lamb is not very ferocious. I'm not scared of a lamb. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus <laughs> fights as a lamb. And they're gonna, all going to make war with him. What the Antichrist, the one world movement, the one world religion is all about, it's against God and the Bible in old time Christianity. And they'll be fighting against God, against Jesus. Now a lot of people think the Antichrist is going to be a substitute Christ in the sense that people would think he's Jesus Christ. I don't think that at all. Anti means against. He's going to be a savior of the world in the sense that they uh, will follow him, think that you know, he's going to bring utopia, he's going to bring peace on earth, but he's not going to do it. He's going to bring war. Uh, but he's not going to even claim to be a savior from sin. He's going to be against the Bible. He's going to be against Christ. He's going to be against God. And they're actually going to fight against him in chapter 19, verse 19 of Revelation. It tells us they're going to make war with the Lamb. But, you know, thank God it says that the Lamb shall overcome them. I mean, it builds and builds like you know, these people are getting ready for war. They're gathering from all over the nation. They're gathering the valley of Megiddo. And it's going to be a great, gigantic war. And Jesus Christ is going to speak with the sword of his mouth. And they're all going to be killed. The beast and false prophet is going to be thrown in the lake of fire. No big deal. I mean, I mean, he just takes care of it and don't even work up a sweat. I tell you, the God that just step out on nothing and speak the universe into existence, you better not rebel against him if you've got any sense and if your brain's working at all. But they're going to make war. But, but notice this. I've got to point out this in verse 16. These ten horns, which are the European leaders working with the Antichrist to bring him to power. You see, the religion and the uh, political system are going to join up together, and each is going to uh, uh, support the other. But now the point's going to come during the Great Tribulation period, they don't need the religious harlot anymore. They've already used her, and so they're through with her. And so in verse 16, these ten horns are the European leaders, which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, this woman that rides the beast, the religious system of that day. They're going to hate her. And she'll make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. We'll study about the destruction of this uh, next time in Revelation chapter 18. But, but uh, God's put in their heart to fulfill their will and give all their kings into the beast. You know, in other words, everybody's going to come to the point during the Great Tribulation period that they all worship the Antichrist. And uh, the, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says the Antichrist, this European leader from the ten, which, which were called common market nation, that is the European Union, that's forming and is already formed actually in Europe right before your eyes. Amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecies happened in the last few years, as the European Union is the old Roman Empire revived and come back to life and will dominate the world. It will use the religious system of the day, the one world religion, to uh, help boost the Antichrist to power. But after he sees, you know, uh, people worship me, I'm the leader, I want them to worship me. I don't need her the religious system in competition to me. So the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, he's going to go, the Antichrist is going to go in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and declare that he is God, that he alone is to be worshipped as God. And the amazing thing is the whole world's going to follow him. And so they're going to destroy, hey, the Roman Catholic Church and all the religions of the world is going to join up with them and to make a one world organization or one world religious organization, it's going to be destroyed. People are going to say, we don't need religion. It's telling us not to commit adultery. It's telling us not to kill, not to steal. We got to follow a book. We don't like that. Most of Europe has already rejected the Bible. In fact, in the European unions, uh, uh, in their platform, in their, uh, what you call it, when they wrote, uh, in their constitution, they make it a point not to mention God. They rejected God. And they're ready and right for the Antichrist. And he's going to declare, we don't need God. After all, we all came through the process of evolution. 
And the church wants to restrict us. We want to have fun. They don't want us to take dope. And they're telling us that we can't. The Roman Catholic Church says don't even use birth control. The Bible never says that. It's all kinds of abominations. One uh, converted Catholic figured up there's 41 abominations or false teachings that the Roman Catholic Church teaches. And when it joins up with other religions, there'll be even more. And so they're going to decide we don't need any religion at all. Uh, our leader is the Antichrist. We have no king but Caesar, the people said in Jesus' day. And they're going to say the same thing, the Antichrist is our leader. But friends, the Bible can predict what is happening. It's already happened. The ecumenical movement is joining the religions of the world together. The European Union is already, it's already formed. We got the One World Bank. We got the United Nations. All of it is shaping up. You better get ready, packed up, ready to go. Jesus is going to come. And another thing, you need to come out from among the world and false organizations. Come out from among them and be your separate, saith the Lord. Let me read Revelation 18 and verse 4 one more time. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. That is this religious organization we just described. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Join up with God's people. Love God's people. But don't join up with the infidels that's in the hell, the false religions that's teaching a gospel that's contrary to the word of God. Stand for the truth. Stand for what's right. It won't be popular, but we're not here to win friends and influence people and we in a popularity contest. But how many can see that these things are already forming today? How many have a spiritual mind? You, leave, you can see that we are, the stage is set. We're ready for these things to happen. Say amen. amen. All right. Let's stand for just a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, we feel like we haven't been as clear as we could be, but we pray it'll be clear enough where the Holy Spirit can use it to impress upon us that we're in the last days when you get ready for Jesus to come because none of these things are going to transpire until Jesus comes and takes his church out of here. We thank you, Lord, for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And God, we just thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name, amen.